Okay. <clears throat> Okay, hey, hope everyone's doing okay, and um, yeah, and hope um, you know these sessions are uh, changing our idea, changing our idea about God. Yeah, it's meant to do that, and also changing our uh, perspective on perspective, meaning the way we look at money. That also is supposed to change because we don't have to hide from money you don't have to be you know uh, we don't have to have double standards about money right we can be sure that this is what god thinks about money therefore i'm going to be confident and this is what i'm going to think also and this is what how, how i'm going to handle money right finances okay okay why don't we pray and then we'll get started right let's pray Father God, we, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for bringing us here. Lord, we thank you for the treasure of revelation that's in your word, Lord, that you are quickening to our hearts by your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father God, that every, Lord, every uh, grain of truth, Lord, that you are revealing to, your, uh, to our hearts, Lord, um, Master, will, will remain on good soil, Father God, and um, be nurtured and uh, bear fruit, Lord, 30, 60, 100, as your word says. Father, we pray that um, that we will be diligent to be doers of your word and not just hearers of your word, Father God. I pray that we will take your word and, um, Lord, renew our thinking uh, so that our behavior, the way we speak, the way we do things, Lord, everything will change, Father God. Be transformed uh, by the renewing of our minds with the truth of your word, Lord. Lord, enable us to do that and enable us to walk with you, God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We give you all the praise at this time and we give you all the glory, God. Uh, Lord, I just pray for uh, those of us here, Lord, who need uh, Lord, who need some ideas, who need some inspiration, <clears throat> especially in the area of finances. Father God, we, um, those who need wisdom, those who need inspiration, and those who need strategies. Lord, we pray for, a, for your anointing, for your grace to bring that, you know. Uh, just go ahead and that open your heart to God and say, Lord, I receive the wisdom that I need. I receive the strategy. Strategy is a series of steps that enables us to do something, maybe breakthrough, uh, maybe put things in place, right? And also inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, ideas. So, Let's just open our hearts and say, Lord, I, I receive that even as you pour out by the power of your Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord, we, we receive that in our hearts, Master. May we may just bubble up, Lord, um, these ideas and strategies and inspiration, Father God. Yes, Lord, I pray that you'll reveal, you'll speak to us as you only can. We thank you. We thank you. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. So last class, we started with principles, right? Uh, principles for divine strategy. Before that, we looked at hindrances, like right? what are the barriers? Now we are looking at principles. You know, a principle is, it's a foundational truth, right? It is uh, something uh, a, a very, very foundational meaning, very basic. And it's as important as a foundation is for a building. Okay, so it's a principle, something that works, something that's laid out in scripture. Right. So we are looking at some of these things which is which are there in the word of God, which actually are connected to divine prosperity. Right? Okay. So let's look at uh, I think we we looked at some of uh, the principles that God laid down last class. Um, so first thing is to put God first in our lives. Okay? To put God first in our lives. What does it mean to put God first in our lives? Right? It means to esteem Him higher than anything else. Right? It means that we consider Him as the final authority of wisdom, of ideas, of you know, of any, anything. Like we go 
to him. Right? We are putting God first. It also means that whatever is on God's heart, okay, whatever matters to him, whatever he he honors or whatever you know he holds in high regard is what we will also hold in high regard. It's, it's the same thing we will do also, right? So that is when we put God first. You know, it's it's it does not simply mean that okay, I I sing a song about putting God first, or I lift my hand and worship Him, you know, or I, you know, so, so many hours I spend in prayer. Yes, all that is good. But putting God first means that daily in our lives, right, all the truth of God's word, right, we, we hold it in high regard, not just as a theory. Right? I know this, I know this is God's word, um, but when do you honor God? When you actually obey and put it to practice in your life. Right? Simple things like, you know, do not lie or do not steal, right? Uh, yeah. all these things, how do we honor God? How do we put God first? Only when we actually take what he has said and apply it in our lives and use it daily in our lives. Otherwise, we are not putting God first. You know, we can say, God, I put you first, God, in my life, but actually we are not. In action, we are not. In words, we could be. We could be saying, right? But in action, in lifestyle, we are not. Okay, so that's what um, we see the Lord Jesus saying, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Um, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Okay? All these things shall be added. So which means that when I put God first, that is the divine order. right? God says, okay, all these things. And if you look at that whole chapter, he's talking about things that Gentiles are seeking. Okay? So people who do not have a relationship with God, who do not have the knowledge of God, they are seeking all these things. These are legitimate needs, food, clothing, shelter. Right? These are what the Gentiles are seeking, but the Lord is saying, you put first the kingdom of God and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added right shall be part of your life right so that's that's a very important principle right okay let's look, just look at what you know uh, god's principles uh, i think we looked at uh, the first one doing what god wants you to be doing okay so we looked at the example of joseph joseph in genesis 39 the lord was with joseph and Joseph was successful, right? In all that he did, in all that he did, wherever he was, in whatever condition he was, whatever environment he was, now that's very important, right? Whatever environment he was in, whether it's a prison, whether it's, a, you know, the owner of the slaves, whether it was that house, or in the palace, he was successful. Right? Because God was with him and he was doing what God wanted him to do. Right? He lived in righteousness. Right? The second thing, second principle that we look at is to practice righteousness. Okay? We know what is right. We know what is the truth. So we, we sometimes even preach what is the truth. Right? But do we practice what is the truth? Right? Do we practice righteousness? Okay. If you look at Psalm chapter 1, okay, the book of Psalms chapter 1, um, this is what we see. Right? It talks about a man who's planted, um, who's, yeah, it talks about a man, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. So the first verse talks about, okay, this is how a man practices righteousness. right? This is how he's practicing righteousness. This is how he's living. How? He's walking not, or which means he's not living in the counsel of the ungodly. 
okay which means ungodly counsel a counsel which is unrighteous counsel okay not the right one or not something that is opposite of god's standards so he does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners what does that mean nor stands in the path of sinners nor stands in the path of sinners does it mean that when a sinner comes and you are there and you don't stand in the same way what does it mean i won't use these steps because you walked on these steps what does it mean nor stands in the path of sinners you are not following in the sinner's footsteps you're not uh, kind of getting encouraged to follow what he or she is doing mm. so which means the choices the kind of lifestyle right the decisions whatever you know a, a, a sinner which means that the, the life is totally against god against god's standards um that we make a decision this man makes a decision not to do that not to do that same thing having recognized that that is against god okay so it says here that uh, blessed is the man blessed is such a man right who walks not who stands not in the path of the sinners nor sits at the seat of the scornful now what is the scornful these are people who make fun make fun of everything and especially something that is right and something that is god honoring and god pleasing so he says i will not sit in that i will not you know not not even uh, be part of that um, you know that conversation or whatever it is right so he's saying so the son is saying blessed is such a man blessed is such a person okay so when we practice that there is obviously the blessing that follows okay the blessing that follows so scripture is very clear blessed is such a man okay now then then why do we fear that why do we fear not doing that maybe we fear rejection right maybe we fear rejection maybe we fear ridicule Re rejection meaning you know hey this guy need not be part of this group or this person need not be part of this group group because he's is is doing the right thing he's too righteous right so maybe we fear rejection right or maybe we fear ridicule like what if they make fun of me what if they laugh at me you know saying this guy or this this woman is so old fashioned times have changed just open your eyes and look around times have changed you are so old fashioned like maybe we fear ridicule and then you know people laughing right people canceling us in today's terms right um so maybe because of that we feel that or maybe because of some kind of persecution or some kind of backlash right something that we might receive because of doing this because of walking in the path of the righteous because of not standing in the counsel of the ungodly but if you look at verse 2 it says his delight is in the law of the lord and in his law he meditates day and night okay so um his delight is in the law of the lord his delight is in the word of god his delight is in god's ways god's standards you now god's desires are something that he delights in right his delight is in the law of the lord and in his law he meditates you know he thinks about it he gives adequate time to think deeply about the word of god about the ways of god and it says in verse 3 he shall be like a tree he shall be like a tree what kind of tree a tree that is planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season okay then whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper no either that is this is true or this is false right but we know that god's word is true it's infallible right so he's laid out a principle saying this is something that you need to do okay this is a principle for divine prosperity yes there could be many shortcuts there could be many ways by which one can get wealth right 
but saying this is how a righteous person will live right and when that person does this the, he will be like a tree and he will be like a tree that bears its fruit in season right which means that there is fruitfulness you know sometimes we see trees we wonder you know when will this bear fruit right there's something defective about the tree or you know it's not getting the right nutrition right um like back home there are some coconut trees where we live um and these trees you know doesn't bear fruit we wondering you know when and even if it bears it is very small right so because there is not adequate nutrition nothing has been done to you know to make sure that there are enough fertilizers or uh, you know whatever infection is there in the tree whatever infestation is there that is taken care of you know maybe you know not those adequate care has been taken right so it's not really receiving that nutrition in order to bear fruit but this tree it's planted by the waters planted by the rivers it's bearing fruit and his its leaves shall not wither right so that is the promise that we have you know there are several other scriptures that we can look into and meditate on here okay. let's move on to the third principle third principle is something like a shock right it says diligent work okay hard work focused intentional work is also a principle for divine prosperity okay we understand that it is a principle for divine prosperity which means that god wants to provide what is divine prosperity what is divine prosperity we looked at it somebody look back in the notes and tell me <laughs> what is divine prosperity we looked at the definition right god is at the center of it yeah somebody just read out what is divine prosperity you found the place anyone online like to read it out adiksha uh, you the, what no? what god has set in his word that's a that's a subject we are studying right yeah okay what is divine prosperity it's in the it's there in the notes it's fundamental truth for his people to prosper huh fundamental yeah. what fundamental is divine truth? prosperity let's see it's there in the notes turn turn even before we started with uh, principles hindrances uh, even god's heart to prosper us right um, and god's guarantee to prosper us even before all that we looked at this god given come on someone quickly um yeah okay gertrude is speaking no um i can't hear actually uh, do we have the uh, is it on mute uh yeah i can hear pastor it. divine prosperity is to prosper to be success successful in any venture hmm so what is prosperity then yeah but is there in the notes yeah yeah got to thank you for the response but um okay lucy living and operating according to god no it, it it's actually a, you know covers a whole lot of things um okay yeah lucy i see that to experience divine prosperity um yeah okay sanjay says page 19 so somebody turn to page 19 <laughs> Okay. Found it? Oh, they are looking at this. Okay, this these notes. Okay. Okay. So, what is divine prosperity? Quickly, quickly, someone. 
Okay, or I'll read it out. Yeah. Okay. Biblical prosperity, right? Divine prosperity. Ah, sorry. Yeah, it is divine prosperity, <laughs> right? Enable, uh, divinely enabled success, growth, and increase. Yeah, so divinely enabled, which means God enabled, right? When we say divine prosperity, it is biblical prosperity, and it's God enabled prosperity. What is the second one? So, uh, sorry, God enabled success, growth, and increase through. Divinely appointed, which means God appointed means or ways or methods, right? For divinely appointed purposes. God appointed purposes. Okay, so, so that's biblical or that's divine prosperity. Okay. So the thing is this, when we look at divine prosperity, we may not connect work with prosperity. We, we, might, we, we may make the connection, okay, I need to work, then I will get money, I will earn, and I will, you know, have some kind of increase, or if I do some business, I will get money. Yes, we, we know that, right? But do we understand that divine prosperity or God-enabled success, growth, and increase, God-appointed methods, work is also part of that, right? Work is also part of that, whatever labor or work God has for us, right? That is also one of the ways in which God wants to bring his prosperity into our lives. Okay? So many times we look at prosperity or God's ways of blessing me is maybe someone gives when I don't you know, expect it or someone gifts something. Someone says, you know, this car is yours, or this bike is yours, or you know, this much money is yours. And we think that that is the only way by which God can actually bring prosperity into my life. Forgetting that work is something that is God appointed. Right? Work is God appointed. Work is not a bad word. Okay. Because we see in scripture, you know, Genesis 2, verse 15, that God God creates man, God puts man, and gives man the, the responsibility to tend the garden and to keep it. Okay, do we see that? Right? Then God, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it, which means to work. Right? You work, you plow, you do something, you guard it, Keeping it is that, to guard it, right? So, when was this done? Was it before the fall or after the fall? Before the fall. Before the fall, okay. And the Hebrew word for tend, which means work and serve and labor. And to keep it means to guard and protect, right? Attend to. So, so in the eyes of, in the eyes of God, work is not something that is sinful, a work is not something that is cursed, right? So God, for God, this is another way, avenue for prosperity. Right? This is another way. We know God's heart for prosperity, right? For prospering his people. Now we've, you know, we've kind of journeyed so far in the course. And so, um, and so we know that we've understood that God's heart is to bless. God's heart is to prosper. He's not against prospering his people. Right? Success, growth, increase, which includes finances, material blessings. We looked at the Old Testament, we looked at all these people, and we looked at their lives and how God has, how God had blessed them. Right? We looked at, you know, uh, and all these examples. So we understand that's God's heart. Right? But now we just need to make the connection that work is also God's design. Work is also God's plan, and work is important in God's eyes. You know, suppose. He gives, you know, you get a job or you get a work, um, a, a, you know, employment somewhere. That is God's way to prosper you, right? But you might say, okay, you know, but I'm I'm studying in Bible college. 
No, why should I go and work, right? And call for ministry? Yeah, maybe. Maybe you call for, uh, you know, uh, a ministry, quote unquote, full time ministry. Maybe in church or maybe you know in any organization. Yeah, that's fine. Perfectly okay. Yeah, okay, you know, but you're also doing the work of ministry, right? You're doing the work of ministry, and maybe God has called you to the, you know, the the, the business world, or you know, God has called you elsewhere, right? Uh, to uh, you know, to to work in some company, some organization, maybe in the government. Well, that is God appointed way to prosper. So we're looking at these principles, and we see that you know diligent work is also part of it. So when we are working, when we we see that it is the design of God, we're not doing something that is against what God has given. God can bring prosperity, and God will enable His plans and purposes to prosper us through that very job or through that employment or through that business okay so that is that is not something you know sometimes we think okay that is not sacred doesn't feel spiritual enough well what did god do in the garden he said okay you look after the garden right do some gardening plant something water it right so how should i work right that's that's something that we need to see Right? Uh, Proverbs 10 and verse 4. Okay, Proverbs 10, verse 4. Okay, what does it say? Proverbs 10, verse 4. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Okay. So he who has a slack hand, meaning slack means lazy um, and to delay, right? You're just dragging your feet. You're not attentive enough. You're not energetic enough, right? Doing the work, but then you know you're just doing it for the sake of doing it. You know, you're not doing it on time. You're not doing it well. But he who's diligent, it means to be to put in a effort, to be prompt, to labor, etc. So it says the one who is diligent, he is rich. He, but the hand of the diligent makes rich which means the when the person puts in a good work uh, and he's diligent then the if the result is different right the result is something that is something that we want okay let's look at one more um, scripture proverbs 6 verse 9 okay proverbs 6 verse 9 Um, actually, from verse six onwards, this is um, this is you know this is what we the instruction to look at some insect, okay, something so small, something so in insignificant, okay, in order to learn a lesson. Okay, that's what we see, right? Go to the ant, you sluggard, meaning you lazy person. Go to the ant, consider her ways and be wise. So which means you're saying God is saying, you know, in nature there are lessons to be learned. In nature, there is a spiritual lesson to be learned. Okay. So he's saying, go to the ant, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Verse 9. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? How long? They're like, when will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Okay, So the Lord is saying, go to nature itself. Go to the things that I have created and learn a lesson about work. Learn a lesson about diligent work. Right? So here's something spiritual that God is saying. You know, you look at nature, something of the natural world, and learn a spiritual principle, which is you need to work with diligence. You know, you have to keep away laziness and complacency far away from you. So, so God is not against us resting, right? We need rest for refreshing. We need rest for our bodies and minds, right? To be recharged and renewed. And definitely God is not against that. In fact, scripture says, the Lord gives his beloved 
sleep, right? And sleep is necessary for us as human beings. We are not machines. God knows that, right? We we sleep, we rest, and that's how we are. He has designed our bodies, so he's not against rest, but he's definitely against complacency and laziness, right? So saying, okay, this is the kind of work we need, you know, diligent work, okay? And diligent work is a vehicle or an avenue or an instrument in God's hands to prosper us. It's a divine principle. Okay, So we should never forget that. You know, I'm working. Don't think, OK, I'm doing something very less spiritual. Or I'm doing something that is, you know, that is not God approved. I'm, I'm like a second class citizen. You know, suppose you, you know, you, God's plan for you is to work. And then you, you go and work somewhere. and and maybe at the same time you're doing ministry. You know, don't look at it like, you know, one who's doing full-time ministry. You know, they are first-class citizens. Uh, uh, but for me, I'm like second and third, and you know, somewhere down the line. No, this is God appointed, right? and this is the quality of work that He's expecting. Like right? to be on time, to have a good attitude, to be productive, to be willing to grow, etc. Right. So that's another principle. Okay. So. What is, it? what is the fourth one? <clears throat> Another principle is put your faith in God. Right? Very simple, but you believe God. You believe God for a good harvest. You believe God for productivity. You believe God for breakthrough. You believe God for that sale. You believe God for that increase. You believe God. And, and whatever we, we have learned uh, as principles of faith, put it to, put it to good use. Right? What is it that you have learned about faith? Tell me. What did you learn about faith? To exercise faith. Okay, so how does one exercise faith? Sorry? Put that into practice. So, um, yeah, example. Anything? We, we learned about faith, right? Last semester? OK. <laughs> and I think Sunday after Sunday this year, we have been looking at faith, if you are attending the services. OK, faith is like a muscle. It needs to be used or exercised. Yeah, so how do we exercise faith? Sorry? Pastor, we can uh, exercise faith by believing and expecting things that we don't see. Mm. Right. So that is one principle in faith, that when you pray, you believe that you've received. Now, these are things that we've learned, right? You pray, we believe that we've received. Okay. Then bless you, saying, speak out, declare. I speak to the challenges, the mountains, declare, make a faith confession. Right? So we know it's not like a mantra that we chant or you know some formula, but it comes from a place of intimacy with Jesus, right? From a place of faith in Him, from a walk with Him, intimate walk with Him, and He has said, "Speak to the mountain." So we speak. Right? Yeah. What else? Faith comes by hearing, like yeah, hearing the word of God. So Romans 10 talks about it. So, so which means I incline my ear to hear God's word so that I increase in faith. You know, Romans 4, fourth chapter, when we read about the faith of Abraham, right? So that's a good place to um, learn, okay, how do I put to practice? Right? He believed God, it says, right? He believed when things were hopeless, right? When it, what was contrary to hope, in hope he believed. Okay, let, maybe we can just quickly uh, look at Romans four. Okay, um, okay, Romans chapter four, verses. Um, Yeah, uh, where do we start? Okay. 
Okay, maybe we can look at um, verse 17 onwards. As it is written, I've made you father um, of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. Okay, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So he believed God. He, he understood this is the kind of God whom I worship, right? Who calls those things that do not exist as though they were. So we believe God. We get to know him personally. We get to know him intimately, right? Know more about him. Right? He's creator. He's a miracle worker, right? He's the deliverer. He's the mountain mover, right? So you get to know about him. Okay. Verse 18 says, who contrary to hope, in hope believe. Okay. So which means not only when I'm, when people are singing praise and worship, you know, when I'm in church and everybody's saying hallelujah and amen, right? And maybe standing up and applauding and wow, that's it. After you step out <laughs> of the four walls of the church or the church service, what it is. Okay. So he says, who contrary to hope, in hope believe. So which means when things were hopeless, right? In the place of work, in the business, when things are hopeless, he still had hope. What is hope? An expectation that something good will happen. Right? He hoped in God. Okay? Uh, so in hope, uh, believed. Okay? So that he became. So when he had this kind of hope, even when things were hopeless, he became, he changed, and he actually became whom God had told that he will become. What did God say? God said, you'll be the father of many nations. Right? So he became. Then what do we see? Verse 19. Okay, It says, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body. Hey, by the way, all this we have learned per semester. Okay, I'm just repeating it. Not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, which means that he did not consider the fact. Okay. He did not deny the fact. It says here that he did not consider his own body. He was an old man, his wife Sarah, barren for many years. He did not consider the fact. Okay. The fact is this. The doctor's report says this. The business, you know, economic times says this. That is the fact. But he went beyond the fact. It says here, he was um, he did not not being weak in faith, which means that he was strong in faith. He did not consider the fact. He went beyond the fact onto God's word. Okay, onto what God was saying. Then verse twenty. Okay, he did not waver. What does waver mean? <laughs> yeah. Waver yeah. means uh, doubt. He did not shake. Sorry, uh, Gertrude. Waver means doubt. Yeah. So which means uh, you you keep changing your mind, right? You just flip flop, right? One day you think like this, and the other day maybe you know think this. Maybe God has forgotten. Maybe God does not want this. So you know he did not waver at the promise of God. So God had promised. God had spoken, and at the time we received the promise, it seemed so good. It seemed like we were so full of it. Wow, God has spoken, God has promised. Yes, I know it'll come true. But three weeks down the line, God, are you there? Where are you, God? No. Did you really speak? Right? So he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Yes, you know, we know that he made mistakes and he listened to, you know, um, Sarah, and then he, you know, he birthed something of the flesh that continues to plague humanity and all that. So we, you know, we, we know that, but he came back, right? And uh, it says he, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. That's another thing. He did not waver, but he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, right? Which means praise and worship. He was just praising God, honoring God. He gave glory to God. And at the as a result of which, he was strengthened in faith. It says here, Right? And being, verse 21, this is the last thing, being fully convinced, fully persuaded, saying, God has said it. He was, he was fully convinced. And because of him praising God and honoring God and coming to that place of walking with God, he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he will perform. He will bring to completion. 
right? So we are called to have faith, and this kind of faith is not just for, you know, I don't know, maybe receiving a healing or a breakthrough, or it is for the place of work as well, right? For the business, for the place of work, to have faith, right? And to and to do things in faith so that it can be an avenue for a pathway for God to provide. It's like a tap, it's like a pipe, right? So that God can actually provide, uh, bring about divinely enabled prosperity for divinely appointed work and methods, right? So it's exciting, right? So, it, which means it changes the way we look at work, right? Okay. Any questions? Anything that you want to add? Anything? Okay. So that's diligent work, right? To be a diligent worker, to um, have faith in God, use the principles of faith. Okay. Um, then. What's the next one? Speak God's word of prosperity over your life. And that's something, you know, that's a principle of faith that we saw. To speak God's word of prosperity over your life. Okay? So we learned all about what God says, what God's thoughts are about prospering you, about prospering me. Right? Does God want to prosper you? Are you sure? So how sure are you? Very sure. And what is your surety? I mean, the, that, the fact that you are sure, what is it based on? Huh? Based on, it should be based on the revelation of God's word. Nothing else. Not the opinion of man. Not because hey, I heard this in uh, biblical prosperity class. No. It cannot be. Right? It cannot be the words of man. Right? It has to be based on the revelation of God's word. Which means you I see the you know, I see what is written here, but Holy Spirit, can you make it give me a revelation in my heart? Right? Because, because we need to base our life on this. We're going to base our life on this. Right? And uh, so we need to be sure, we need to be sure, con convinced fully, so that we can be persuaded fully to stand in faith. Right? So, so we speak God's word of prosperity. We say, God, this is what you've said. And so, God, I speak that, I declare that over my life. I just want to declare, God, that I am blessed. I am blessed like the tree that is planted by the rivers of water. Yes, Lord, I will bear fruit in its season. My, the leaves will not wither. And I will be like that tree, right? And I will walk in victory. I will be like, um, uh, you know, uh, the um, Proverbs 18, what it says, you know, a man shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth, from the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. And the other principle, verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit so so you you declare and say you know i have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places right and i have access to this grace through faith right it, christ has already paid the price he has made this accessible to me but i have access to it through faith right he has already blessed me and it talks about galatians uh, we, we read about the fact that, you know, he became a curse for me so that I might receive the blessings of Abraham in Christ Jesus, right? So we have all this proof. We have all these verses. So we begin to speak that over our lives. We begin to declare that over our lives, right? And the best time to do that is you know, when things are going fine, right? We are not in a crisis. And things are going fine. And that's the best time. Emotionally, you are okay. Right? That's the best time to start speaking and building strength in our lives. And saying, you know, this is who I am. And this is what God has promised for me. This is what God has made available for me 
through his blood. You know, how do we have access to all this? Because of the shed blood of Christ, right? right? That is what it is. It's the greatest sacrifice which has made all this possible, which has reversed the curse. Right? So the blessing of Abraham, I can receive it, right? So speak God's words of God's word of prosperity. It's not man's word, God's word of prosperity, right? And, um, and lastly, uh, we look at, oh, I'm sorry, I think there are some more. Yeah. Uh, we look at, you know, we honor God in our finances. And under that, we're going to look at, uh, you know, tithing and offering and, and so on. Um, so, yeah, so we're going to look at um, all that. But we honor God with our finances. Well, sometimes we separate that, okay, um, whatever money is there and, uh, you know, how do I worship God with money? And, you know, there seems to be a confusion. But we need to honor God with our finances. The way we honor God is when we give to the work of God. We give for the work of the kingdom of God, right? Wherever it is, whatever it, God puts in your heart. And, uh, you know, in Second Corinthians, we see Paul writing, and this is what he uh, says. You know, let's um, go there. Um, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. Okay. So, you know, we'll, we'll be coming back to it um, next class. But this is what he says. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, this is a, this is a practical wisdom in agriculture. So you sow more seeds, you get more in return, right? So he states that. And then he says, so let each one give. So in the same way, let each one give. How? As he purposes in his heart. Okay. Not because somebody's telling you to give. Not because somebody's saying or forcing you and saying, okay, you know, uh, uh, brother, this is, uh, we need it desperately. We need this for the work of ministry. Please give. And then you are like, oh, should I give? Should I not? Oh, man, he's asking me over and over again. Let me give. No. Saying you, as you purpose in your heart, as you decide, right? So let one, let each one give. Verse 7, as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly. Grudgingly means you hesitate. Yeah, you know, you're just dragging your feet. You're taking your time and you're saying, should I not? You know, should I? I don't feel like giving, but because he's asking, I'm, I want to give. Or he will trouble me again, so I want to give. Not grudgingly or of necessity. How? For God loves a cheerful giver, which means you purpose in your heart and you wholeheartedly give. And God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you. God is able, right? Make all grace, unmerited favor abound towards you, abundance, that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Okay. Just listen to that. That you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. You see the heart of God. Right? Again, God's heart for man God's heart for finances in man comes through. He's, make, he's able to make all grace abound towards us that we having all sufficiency for everything that we may have abundance for every good work. Okay, So when we honor God with our finances, when we give to the work of his kingdom. Okay, So we'll stop here today and next class we'll go on to giving and uh, look more into, um, into it. Right. Thank you so much.